Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper, where we talk to the founders and futurists designing the next version of the world. My name is Jeremy Gilbertson. I'm founder of something called Right to Know You. I like to read. I like to write. I like to process. What the heck is going on in the world? With me, as always, is Mark Fielding, talented writer, lore developer, storyteller <laughs> for hire. Guys, yeah. if you need something written, this is your dude. Um, Mark, tell us about the book club, because I just intro the show. Tell us about the book club. The book club. Well, luckily, I have some props here for the book club. Um, the design of everyday things, the book we're reading at the moment, the Nexus. Yeah, every week we run a book club where we dissect chapters of insightful books line by line to get something more out of them. Um, very excited for today's show, though, Jeremy. We're going into the metaverse again, my favorite word. Um, today, we're going to be going deep into what it means for business, brands, manufacturing, education, entertainment. How, how, how can it give hope to the struggling, sanctuary to the persecuted, and meaning to the lost? Ooh, that was deep, I like man. that. Yeah, it that was, was deep, deep because I think often we talk about the metaverse and the virtual worlds and we're, we're laughed out of town and we're a technological species now. We're going into the future hand in hand with these technologies and we need to have deep, meaningful conversations about what it means to be human. No? Absolutely. In this show, we'll get to the show intro in just a second, but I think what's going to be really interesting is we're rooting the metaverse in things like stoicism and the Tao Te Ching and, and how these principles, these tried and true old philosophical constructs kind of apply and extend into uh, futurism and the metaverse and all kinds of other things that we want to talk about. We'll sprinkle a little bit of Carl Sagan, I think, into some of this discussion and, and, and that sort of thing. But before we get to the show intro, thank you so much to our friends at Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E, marketing's on-demand talent platform. They've been a great sponsor of the show uh, for, geez, the last, you know, nearly a year. And uh, they have um, they have a great platform, 3,000 plus solopreneur, talented, creative, technical resources that you can pull onto your team. They have a new uh, version where they can quarterback a team of multiple interdisciplinary resources. They're amazing. W-R-I-P-P-L-E.com. Check them out. And uh, without further ado, Mark, let's bring our guest on. I, I like us, that analogy. That, that Super Bowl. That Super Bowl analogy. Now we have a Super Bowl final to head into. Um, yeah, our guest. So, um, Mr. Metaverse Aragon Merlindich. He's the CEO, CMO of Your Own Metaverse. He's a speaker. He's a researcher. He's a writer. He's a thinker. He's a philosopher. He expounds knowledge on artificial intelligence, augmented reality. He's an historian. He references Carl Sagan, as you said. And we're very, very happy to have him here. Welcome to the show, Aragon. Hello, everybody. Hello, Jeremy. Hello, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. And I, listening and you introduce every, uh, the show and everything, I realize that, Mark, you've got some Shakespeare DNA in you. You're probably a descendant, aren't you? Well, it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, so I, I live, I'm from a place that's, very, very close to Stratford upon Avon. So, well, see, there you go, man. Yeah. You were so eloquent in describing, you know, what we're trying to do, uh, f exploring, you know, the future of humanity, of philosophy, of, of society. You said it so eloquently. I can't even come close. But together, I thought that was Shakespeare. That we should. I, it's good that we have this recorded, right? Let, let's hold. Yeah, we, we have this recorded. recorded. Okay, but it's because important, we need to isn't it? For posterity. It, well, it's important though to have. And, and you're a big proponent of this serious, meaningful, engaged conversation about what it means. We can get poetic, we can get deep, we can get philosophical and we should, we have to. I, th I think it's, in fact, I think it's really important. Um, if I may be so bold, like this week I, I posted something because I had a conversation with a physicist or a theoretical physicist and he was kind of not so amused with futurist quote unquote uh he, he said something along the lines like these people they they try they try to predict the future from looking at pictures but they don't actually understand any science and they don't appreciate scientists but i would argue that the art well 
I, I would say science is also an art, okay? But that's a different conversation. But the, the traditional artists, right? Uh, the humanities, writers, um, uh, are the people that actually shape the future more than the scientists. Because these are the people that come up with these seemingly outlandish ideas or concepts or, you know, for the future or what we should be or, or ideals for how humanity should evolve or, or you know, develop further. And, and it's only when they come up with it that we start to kind of, at least that's my belief, right? And this is also, for example, something that uh, uh, Viktor Frankl said uh, famously. He said, like, idealists are the real realists because if you want to get here and you're going here you need to fly in that direction and it's called crabbing he has this like this amazing keynote in black and white you can find it on youtube if you want to get here you need to fly in that direction so you your goal should always be something that is an ideal to get to the real point of what you can actually be and that goes for man that goes for society um so yeah so i just I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, no, that's that's amazing, and and you already kicked it kicked this conversation off in a, in a, in in the right spot because there's this intersection of science, of technology, and of art, and you know that in in our first book club for thinking on paper we read the Nexus and the the Nexus the author Julio Latino and by the way you can get all the episodes. Uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, uh, special book club episodes. But the reason why I wanted to bring that up is is what Julio presents as the connective tissue between all of those things is design. So how someone designs an experience, designs a product, has all of those things and all of those pieces and parts uh, interwoven in a very interesting way. So as you think about the future, Aragorn, tell me how being rooted as a historian prepared you for exploring the fu- the future. <laughs> Oh, wow. It was bound to happen that somebody was going to ask me that question. <laughs> so, so actually, uh, the funny thing is that I, I, oh man, I shouldn't make this too long of a story, but let's just say I want to, I want to give special thanks because I was very, like many people have this story of the only really good teacher they had in the high school or, or school was, was their history teacher, right? A lot of people have that story, but I was truly blessed because I had two very special men who were my history, uh, well, among some other topics, but history teachers. One was a philosopher and the other one was a real, real, real hardcore historian. And both of them were great at telling stories. And I think that at a very early age, they started to inspire me uh, with history, with the stories of history. But the thing is, what really, really drove me on, and which is also at the core of what I do now, is that um, I was very bad at actually reproducing historical facts, right, even to this very day. I wasn't very good at remembering the years or the dates or exactly what happened, but I was very good at seeing the connections, how one thing would lead to another, understanding the flow of certain society in that space and time to and how it would evolve or into something else and how the people played a role in that, you know. And so I got always high marks because it, whenever we did a test, they asked for a particular answer. And if I even if I didn't have that particular answer, I would go into an answer where I would explain why that answer was it what was relevant to know about that age rather than the particular date? And they always gave me very high scores. So they motivated me to, to keep thinking in that way and not to put too much emphasis on exactly getting the numbers right. And when I left high school, I went to study history. The reason I eventually dropped out, because I am a dropout, was because I was bored with history in university as it was presented to me mostly, and I may I might have just been unlucky with the educators that I got there, but as me having to learn a lot of facts and just cramming it all in my head. And I had no idea how that would add to me being a valuable member of society. So that made me decide eventually to leave university and to just get to work. And I ended up getting to work in the IT sector. But when I came back to, well, when I came to futurism a few years ago, uh, because I was in this role of CMO at at Europe Metaverse, and people kept asking me to give my opinion and go on stage and talk about how I've envisioned all of this future and this technology coming together and how it would impact society. I realized that what I was continuously doing, I was doing the same thing that I did in history, but I was also doing it with that historical perspective in mind. I was I was seeing that things that Plato said about how society or democracy will evolve were, for example, being um, 
being uh, boosted or catalyzed by modern technology. So, for example, Plato said any democracy has several stages in its life, right, in its life cycle. And by the end of a life cycle of a democracy, the subcultures are so far apart that they no longer have shared values and thus no shared reality and thus they don't, they're not capable of cooperating anymore. And this is exactly what we're seeing in the world today. And in fact, social media has has driven that so far that, for example, in Gen Z, we now see that even within one single generation, where traditionally we have always seen that people would have more or less the same values, more or less the same shared reality, we now see that there is a splintering, a fragmenting or a sharding, whatever you want to call it, where there's almost different groups in a single generation that have different views and opinions and ideas on because they no longer have a shared reality. Right. So what Plato said would happen in our world, in the world, without technology, is now happening, but it's happening at an accelerated pace because of technology. So yeah, that's just one example of how I use my histor- historical knowledge and etc. to kind of understand the present and the future. I, I love that, and there's so many things we could talk about and so many ways we go off um just one thing i was i don't know if there's a a podcast by a guy called um blind boy and a few weeks ago he spoke about the history of greek mythology and how greek mythology is a reflection of the simulation theory and how the, the greek gods were essentially creating a simulation of virtual reality on earth to play out their desires which is a bit you know the first simulation theory was the greek (laughs) <laughs> mythology which I, I, yeah. I don't have the knowledge or names to get into but you've led into a nice a nice segue into education Aragon and mm-hmm. how you said you were bored with your education I don't think I was the best example of a student during my time I don't I think a lot of people don't agree with the way that education is taught in your experience do you see it's going in the right direction how do you envisage it if you could create or write the story of the ed- education for the next 20 30 years wh- how would you use this technology to do it what would you what do you imagine Ooh, okay so that, 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 that let's unpack that because there's actually a couple of different questions in there that might be explained in a different way uh, or answered okay. in different ways so first of all the you know where i think education should be heading or what is really essential for education today i, I think we're seeing in the world now an exacerbation of a problem that's already existed for the past maybe 20 years. And that is that our governmental or, or, or like our, yeah, our governments and by extension, our educational systems are absolutely incapable of keeping up with the speed of change. Yeah. We see an educational system that is in, well, maybe not completely, but to a large extent still operating as it was a hundred years ago. Uh, and it's failing us. It's, it's not just failing us, it's failing our youth because the whole purpose of education is to prepare another generation for the future they will be experiencing. And here's the issue. I mean, for those that follow me, they know that my whole point is that human evolution or human development is linear. Our brains, our bodies, everything we do is linear. However, the technology that we created is in fact not developing along a linear path, but is developing along a multiple exponential path. And we've come to that point where the acceleration of technological development is going at such an incredible pace that we are no longer able to keep up with our systems, with our mindset, with how we engage with these systems. And our educational system is probably one that suffers at this point the most and is also the most relevant because if this system does not function, it is improperly preparing our youth for the future they will be living in. And we see that today in the massive discussion that's now going on along uh, about AI, right? How do we incorporate AI in, in, in educational institutions? There's no legislation. There's no direction. Uh, some educational institutes try to ban it. Others try to embrace it. But nobody really knows how. The educators that work there are maybe 50-50, but that's a, you know just a random number, uh, either accepting it, think it's great, or they're like, we, I don't want to use it myself. I think this is undermining my profession. And so that, there's a real problem there, and that should be addressed, and it should be the absolute number one priority above anything else. Because if we don't properly prepare our youth, what we will see is we'll see the same thing happen here as we did with social media, where also nobody was prepared. With the rise of the internet, the rise of mobile internet, the rise of social media, nobody was prepared for what it would do to the minds 
and and souls. I, I don't believe in souls, but the spirit, let's say, um, of of the next generation. And that's what we're reaping the not rewards, but the failure that you know the problems of now because we have a whole generation Gen Z, uh, that is. Uh, struggling with all kinds of anxiety problems, and and they're, they're sh- they don't have a shared reality, and you know, the, the, you name it. You can find anything about. Go on social media; you'll see it in five seconds. Burnouts, uh, the whole thing at, at, at age twenty. So that's one point. And then the next point, if we can, ta- let's say that we can tackle that problem. Let's say that we can change education to once again become an institute that prepares our youth for the future. Then the next question becomes, how do we incorporate technologies, these technologies that are now so impactful into our educational system? And there I foresee a wondrous, almost unimaginable, well, I I guess in science fiction it has been imagined future, where suddenly everyone will have access to private tutors powered by AI. And I'm not talking about, you know, 50 years in the future. I'm talking about 10 years from now, everybody will have access to private tutors, AI models that are built upon the, you know, the foundation of trying to be like Shakespeare, if you want to be, if you're interested in writing or Michelangelo, if you're interested in the humanities, uh, 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 sorry, painting, um, uh, based on Einstein, if you want to learn about physics, and these will not only be powered by AI, giving them personalities based on everything that we know of these men, making and then improving them to be the perfect, the perfect educator, right? Because we already know that ChatGPT is proving to be consistently more empathetic than doctors, right? Because it understands how to talk to humans. We know that the so, so we can make a perfect AI that is a perfect educator that can stimulate us, give us the carrot and the stick in the perfect balance, help us understand, give it personality. And then, of course, the metaverse. I mean, we know that the technology is now being developed. The Vision Pro just came out. Not everybody is as excited or as happy with it, which I totally understand. But here again, we are in the knee of the curve. The the, the development of these technologies is accelerating. There's a company in Switzerland called Serial. They already produced holographic projection lenses that can be worn like real glasses that project an image into your eyes that overlays reality. So I am convinced that in 10, 15 years, you not only will we have AI powered tutors, we will also have the ability to make them like they're actually there standing right next to you in any room, any environment, and you can engage with them. So in that sense, the future of education, at least if we allow technology uh, to come into it, will be able to revolutionize the way people can learn. They will be able to learn at their own pace. They will be learn, be able to learn for any educator they want in any way that will really help them. They will be inspired like I was by my history teachers, by the greatest minds in human history. At least that's my belief. That was a very long rant, I hope. It was, it was, a, <laughs> it was a great rant. Could I just not push back on that, but I know you speak about the challenges of this and... So last year, I went. I, I went with a, a school of kids from Paris, from um, the, the the wrong side of the tracks, possibly as a way to describe. And they they weren't using AI at school at all. And yet, I was speaking to other kids, and they were. And one of the things in my research and my writings, and one of the questions I keep coming up against myself is how do we not end up in a world of the haves and the haves nots with technology? How do we, how, how do we make it fair that everyone has access to these super AI agents that help them and not just the privileged few elite or however you describe it? How, how do we stop that imbalance or, or will, will AI take care of that for us? I, okay, <laughs> sorry, I was a little distracted from Joris. Joris is posting questions in chat. I was reading that as well. Um, so yes, so I, how will that prepare us? Um, how no, the haves and the haves not that not. That yeah. was your question. I'm not sure I have an answer to that, and I will admit straight off the bat I'm, that there is a serious, serious risk for exactly what you're describing. There is a risk that we create a world in which. Some people have access and others have not. However, it is my belief that that future is less likely than the alternative where, um, uh, let me describe it this way. There's a great book by Jeff Booth called The Price of Tomorrow. Now this Booth, uh, sorry, this book (laughs) mainly uh, revolves around the idea of, for example, Bitcoin and the decentralized future, right? 
But he makes a point that is not limited to those technologies because the point he makes is that technology is, in essence, the most deflationary power in human history. So if you combine that belief with my belief and that, for example, Ray Kurzweil, that technology is in an accelerating development path, right? That means that its deflationary power will only increase. And I think artificial intelligence is right now giving us an incredible glimpse of what that looks like and what that will be like already. Because we suddenly see that the whole world, well, not the whole world, maybe a lot of people are not aware, but you know, governments worldwide and 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 analysts worldwide, you know, from Bloomberg to McKinsey to to Deloitte to, you know, they, they all bring out reports saying, you know, the, the WEF, we're going to lose 300 million jobs over the next five years, right? We're going to impact, uh, we're going to, oh, sorry, we're going to impact 300 million jobs. We're going to lose 89 million jobs in Europe alone um, as a result of AI. So that shows the deflationary power that this technology brings to the table. If you combine that, for example, with what was just launched, at the CES, they launched the Rabbit R1, right? The Rabbit R1 is a $200 device. So it is a fraction of the cost of a modern smartphone. Let me emphasize that. That allows you to have a direct interaction with an AI, which can do anything for you that you want. And of course, we haven't had it in our hands yet. I haven't tried it out yet, but I am an optimist. I think this this is going to be really great. And even if this doesn't work perfectly, it's a first gen. Right? So that means two or five years down the line, we'll have devices like these that will be much, much, much better. Think of how much iPhone progressed in you know, a decade or half a decade. Right? So this technology is not only going to be cheap and accessible to a lot of people. I mean, a chat GPT, chat GPT is free. Chat GPT plus is 20 bucks. That is the best money ever spent. If people don't spend that, I don't know what they're doing, but they're making the wrong decisions in their life. But this is today. The prices historically for these kind of things only go down. Think about what an email inbox cost a decade ago. Think about you know anything what anything cost a decade ago. I mean, in total numbers, you might say, well, things have become more expensive, but the amount you pay for a gigabyte of storage in your Gmail, you know, is down what a million fold maybe. I don't know. This is an arbitrary number, but it's a lot. Let's agree on that. And the same is going to happen for AI. So to me. Oh, and, th- and then there's one more thing to take in mind, that AI is a technology, a very impactful technology that really quickly drives the development of itself, making itself cheaper. And we already see that because a great example of that is, for example, how NVIDIA has been able to use in, in a few years' time, they've increased their capability of rendering 3D graphics by more than a thousandfold. And they're even even this year they doubled it by losing using something called DLSS 3.5, right? Which is basically AI used to render more frames uh, without having to need more compute. So those developments they're not limited to that field. If you combine all of that, what you see is that this technology is very rapidly making things very cheap, very easy to do, with a lot less compute than we initially needed to create the first versions of it, which means that in in a matter of of few years, this technology will be like available to everybody everywhere in the world for almost for, for, for nothing. Like it will be a commodity like electricity. Right, so that means that the chances of a lot of people getting left out are are far less likely, in my opinion. It's it's really interesting. Uh, there's so many points you bring up that I that I want to jump down and and discuss <laughs> further. Um, you have to interrupt like, me if I talk too much. No, no, no. This is great. This is great. So the a couple things come to mind, right? So yeah, the accessibility question is 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 out there, right? And it's it, it comes down to like, hey, number one, do you have access to the internet, right? So that's kind of improving as 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 things scale and then also access to devices that were, you know, thousands of dollars. Now, like you said, the rabbit is, you know, something that you can interact with AI with for a couple hundred bucks, a couple hundred bucks for some people is still a bit of a challenge. But when, when I think about this, I want to go back to this. I have a personal dichotomy with technology and it's very difficult to navigate because I'm, I'm a technologist in some cases, but I want to get away from technology as well. And you mentioned the younger generation, higher anxiety, higher stress, uh, difficulty to to find you know, meaningful communities and interactions. Like with tech advancing so rapidly, how do we make sure the human connection, the human human element, stays uh, tangible and accessible in all of this? 
Maybe it doesn't have to. <laughs> uh, that's an interesting one. We, we might want to explore that one. But my, my personal view on that so far has been that we're in a transitional phase. Uh, I, I mean, d- despite the fact that I use history always to kind of inform my view on the, on the future, we also have to accept that we are going through something that has never before been, at least not in recorded history, not in recorded human history being experienced before, right? I mean, there, there's, of course, people like... Uh, I like that, uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe uh, you know, a long, 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 long time. Yeah, ago. That, of course, yeah. <laughs> What's it called? Uh, apocaly- ancient apocalypse. There, there's people that make, make an interesting case for the fact that maybe there were older civilizations, but we don't know about those. So let's start and stick with what we do know. In our time and in the history that we do know, there's never, ever, 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 and I want to stress this, ever been a situation like we're in today. There's never been a technology that we know of like today. There's never been a development of technology that we know of like today. So it is in a ser- in a serious sense, we're going into the complete unknown. Um, and now I have a brain, uh, I have a, a small stroke because I forgot <laughs> the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Never before have we seen this this confluence of of technologies, right? But then I would also say like, and maybe this is just me. I'm 47. You know, maybe I'm just starting to realize what's really happening in all areas of the world. But it seems like you know, challenge and strife and conflict, economic, political, cultural, all of that stuff happening. Like there seems to be a confluence in an in a in a rise in in just the dissatisfied. A lot of people are dissatisfied with the systems that are currently broken. So you have even bigger uh, potential for for change. Yeah, but even, so but even I, though I, I, the 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 actual real consensus is the world is infinitely better than it was. Every year it gets better. We are going in the right direction, but we're led to believe that we're not. Hmm. Mm, yeah, right. this is always this is what I tell my mom. This is always what I tell my mom because my mom, my mom, my mom is seventy eight, and she is convinced there's more crime today than there was when she was young, right? And I tell her mom that that's just simply not true. Statistically speaking, that's absolutely impossible. The only difference is that when you were young, you you would at best hear about a burglary two streets down, right? At best, if you were lucky, uh, and and now you're sitting at home on the couch in the evening with your phone in front of you and you hear about, you know, the, the Moroccan mafia doing a raid <laughs> somewhere in on the other side of the planet, you know, whatever, or the, or the drug cartels. And then you're like, oh, there's so much crime. Yeah, but it's not how it works, right? You, your perception is there's more crime, but that's not reality. And you need to keep that in mind. And this goes back to what I said before, right? We're living in a world where we, we're seeing a fracturing of realities because depending on what you're looking at, depending on what you are consuming through technology, uh, that will give you a completely different perspective on the world. Coming back to, you know, how will this make us more dystopic, basically, if I just put it back together as you asked before, Jeremy. So my belief is that we're in a transitional phase, right? We're in a transitional phase with technology for the first time. We're not at an end station. And one could argue, so... So one could argue we're never at an end station, but the the thing to realize here is that I think that as we're moving into a further development of the internet, we will come to a point where the the, the virtual reality or the metaverse, I don't know if that word's going to stick, but will become an alternative version of reality that will incorporate a lot of our humanities again. Because that's what the current internet is completely lacking. If you go online, you only communicate through written text. And you might think, that, oh, there's video content and you can do video calls. And But the truth is 99.999% of all the interactions that people have are not only not in real time, they are in written form, which means there is a massive amount of potential for miscommunication, misinterpretation, projection, etc. And that is leading to the dystopic uh, uh, nature of reality realities at this point. And if you go anywhere else on the internet where you don't have that so much, like for example, online gaming, where people come together, friends come together on Discord, they talk to each other, then that's not so much the case. And why is that? It's because you're talking to each other with a voice. You can hear each other's voice modulation. So you're bringing in a lot of the human humanity back in because we have evolved over millions of years to look at each other, to see each other's facial expressions, our body language, listen to each other's voices, and we communicate much more in that than we truly realize. 
And so my belief is that is as we transition into a metaverse-esque kind of world, more three-dimensional in our interactions, even the personas that we saw on the Vision Pro the last few days, it's bringing a lot of that humanity back in, like facial expressions and voice, et cetera. And so in a future version, that might improve the situation again. Of course, that doesn't address the sharding of realities, which is a separate topic. I love what you, you, you mentioned, the co-creation of realities. And I, like Joris in the in the chat, he great question. Will, I, will AI be able to create dr drive community? Will it be able to create that kind of by dual creation of reality, which from what you're saying is kind of what we're missing is this. We kind of create our own realities. We're not creating realities with other people like we used to as, a hu as humans once did. I... It Aragorn, if you're open for a for an experiment, I, I've been watching a couple of your videos uh, on what the future looks like from from 2024 and back. I thought it would be really fun uh, to have a little uh, to to pretend we have a bit of a time machine. So so bear with me on how I tee this up. Let's cross our fingers and and and, and see what works. Oh, I didn't so, know. Oh. Hey, we're going right here. So, hey, hey guys, we're uh, here with thinking on paper. We figured out a, a time machine to look into the future. We're going to the year 2024. We have this guy joining us somehow. I don't know how this technology works, but we are going to go to 20 or some sorry 2045, yeah. and uh, and see what this see what this gentleman has to say and see what we can learn about the world. Um, Aragorn, this is the first time machine um, show uh, from 20 uh, you know 2024. You're in 2045. What's going on? What can you tell us, man? Like the world's a little funky now. <laughs> What's going on there and what should we know about the future? Well, guys, uh, I'm so happy you asked. Uh, in fact, I, I just came from the beach where, uh, <laughs> in fact, I'm kind of still on the beach and I'm also still wearing just my, my beach shorts, which obviously you can't see because I turned it so that you only see what I, you know, the, what, the projection of me, which is like this wearing a black shirt, you know, I don't want to distress anybody. But right now things are pretty awesome. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be honest. Uh, there's a, only about 4 billion left of us. We lost about 4 billion uh, oh, wow. in, the 20, in, in the 2030s. Yeah, uh, yeah. Towards the end of the 2020s, um, the Ukraine-Russian conflict still wasn't uh, decided. Uh, Elon Musk decided to pull out his support for the Ukraine. He took away their Starlink, which enabled Russia to uh, actually finally win that war. Um, but... Uh, towards the end of it, they released an artificial intelligence uh, virus, so to speak, and and have kind of wiped out the internet uh, in most of Europe. So that was a, a pretty tragic moment there. Um, uh, yeah, it seems a little unreal, you know, kind of just, I don't know how to say it. I have my own dissociation with it because thinking back on it, it was just an incredibly weird time. Um, then, of course, you know, in the 2030s, when we finally started to recover from that, um, we had a massive global outbreak again of a an AI generated CRISPR engineered virus, which that is what wiped out half the global population. And the only reason we didn't all get wiped out because luckily we had COVID. It sounds crazy if I'm saying this right now, but luckily we had COVID and that prepared the world for something like that. And so we had all of these new mechanisms in place, which were really ridiculed throughout the 2020s because people were saying, look, the World Economic Forum is trying to take our freedom and all of that. They want us to do all these kind of weird shit and things. And I understand looking back that people thought that, but eventually that was, that was really what probably saved us from extinction. Um, but the thing is that Unlike you wouldn't have expected this, maybe, but this really brought us together as a society. As a, as it brought us together globally, because after half of us get wiped out, there was this realization moment across the world that that we should not be fighting each other, but that we should working together. And so, what seemed like a dystopic future at the time, because I remember we had this episode twenty years ago, and we talked about the shared, uh, you know, shattering of reality or sharding of reality. Uh, and that was happening through technology. But but this moment in time in the 2030s made us all realize that uh, all we have is each other. And this this little blue dot suspended in, in space like a mold of dust. And, and we need to be on it together. And so we collaborated with AI. And in the next 10 years, we created a kind of utopia. We're now exploring space. We're at the edges of the solar system. Uh, artificial intelligence has allowed us to create Dyson spheres. We're harnessing 
the energy from the sun in ways like we were never able before. Throughout the 2030s, we developed further fusion technology. There's abundant energy now. We clean up the oceans and we're actually uh, creating whole massive reservations in massive parts of Africa, Asia, and uh, North America and Europe where humans are free to go and live in nature, but they're no longer able to bring technology in there. Uh, and we have these kind of reservations for humans where they can live with technology. And But there's no need for infrastructure anymore because things like Starlink developed to the point where everything is decentralized. So I can be anywhere in the world and I can virtually allies anything to the point where you and me can have a, uh, like like we were together in the 2020s. I've, That's I, a I know, very and, um, explosive 20 years. Oh, God. It reminds me of, so I, I read Super Intelligence really recently and he speaks about the different expansion rates of AGI essentially. And, and you're talking about a, a mass explosion where everything happens like one super intelligence takes the lead and everything unfolds incredibly rapidly. Is that what yeah. happened? That is, uh, yes, that is what happened. Uh, and that is, that is what is happening. Um, it's funny because actually I remember that somewhere in the early 2020, no, was it 2023? I think 2023, Elon Musk went on TV or was it YouTube? <laughs> I don't remember. He, he said like the best way to look at the future is probably through the books of Ian M. Banks and the culture series where he talks about a future humanity being ruled by AI uh, my, metal minds that kind of take care of everything and we're free to do as we like. And so the biggest challenge was for us to find purpose, not drive through our job or our function in society, but, you know, just to find purpose in existing. And this is actually uh, what happened. And, and actually... This it was a little that was a little tricky because by the end of the 2030s, 2038, 2039, uh, there was a there was really I mean initially I thought this I know back then I thought this was going to happen in the 2020s I thought that within five years you know 2026 old jobs would start disappearing and, and we would have to go through this absolute crisis of of uh, you know existence of of purpose but because of what happened with the Ukraine war and then of course the global virus that kind of got pushed back and so by the end of the 2030s we we finally when things settled down the dust settled we had tried to rebuild society and then people realized that nobody needed to work anymore more because we simply didn't have that need we didn't have these markets anymore and ai and robotics could do anything for us and so we went through that wait wait, 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 wait. i want to i want to stop you right there i want to stop you right there because it's all right so nobody works in the future how do you how do you eat how do you well that's not entirely true everyone has a podcast Jeremy. everyone just does podcasts all the time it's it's funny that you say that but it's a little bit like i mean it's not that people don't work but they don't work for money they don't work for money like if you want to have a if you have a community garden where you're growing you know by lolly organically grown vegetables you can do that right lots of people do that they spend every day in their garden they love it they live for it and they enjoy having that dinner together with friends and family, uh, enjoying their own produce, their own, enjoying what their own labor created. People choose that because so, it shows so them. Yeah. So but, have industrial food systems gone away? Like distribution of that? Is it more localized? Like where well, are we? I, this is probably hard to believe for you, but you, you know, those crazy machines they had in Star Trek where what? you like said, like, uh, Earl Grey hot and you just got your cup of coffee. Well, you know, we got those. <laughs> wow. Wow. I've always I've always wanted one of those. Do we also have the the transporter? No, because we haven't been able to figure out how to transport a person from one place to the next and make it re- have it remain the same person. And this is actually one of the only challenges that we have and even AI hasn't been able to f- to solve this with us. Although I mean the question whether people have a soul, you know, is, is still something that we haven't solved. And of course, you know, most of us are not very religious in the sense that we were at the beginning of the 2020s. Most major religions as they existed today are gone. But there's some essence to the, phys- the, the nature of the universe that we have not figured out yet, even with AI, at least not at this point. And so transporting somebody like that and reconstructing them on the other side let's just say that when it was attempted by somebody who was going against the legislation around that it doesn't didn't end very well for them right so, so maybe kind it, was of had- more, it was more willy wonka's experiment with mike tv but let's talk about like let's <laughs> or the or the fly or the or the fly all right so there's a theoretical physicist that 
projected a couple of years ago in, in the early 2020s, maybe, you know, late 2018, 2019, Michio Kaku. And he's predicted that we would be able to beam our consciousness, right? Because we're all, all this is, is electrical signals up top here, right? So reconstructing yeah. electrical signals and beaming yeah. them across. So is, that a, is that a means of, of transportation these days in 2035? Uh, okay. So uh, yeah, technically, yes, but it's more along the lines of maybe you've ever seen this series back then in the books, uh, Altered Carbon. Uh, where they were able to put their uh, consciousness onto stacks. So the thing is that although technically your consciousness is on a stack, it's still kind of a copy, right? And so the problem is that you can have two people with the same consciousness and then neither of them knows who is the original, which kind of creates this conundrum. So we have legislation that prohibits this from being done. That's not to say that we don't all have a chip, uh, that can be used for some purposes, but it's illegal at this point to use that to make yourself immortal in the sense that once you die, you just boot up another human being and you have your your, your data uploaded and continue as if it, uh, it were, because we don't have that. But we don't need to, because as long as we don't kill each other, we don't really have any real reason to die, right? The, the, the science at this point, uh, without, this was developed actually in the mid of the 2020s through stem, stem cell. Uh, it was a progress on stem cell technology developed by Adil Khan, if I uh, remember correctly, from Toronto. And he basically developed this technology together with Dr. David Sinclair, where they could reset our cells to any age that we want and then have them maintain at that age. So basically, I never have to age. And like Aragorn in Lord of the Rings, I get to choose my own time of death. So you guys so you guys have hacked into the telomeres uh, that, that power the aging of cell structure. Wow, that's fascinating. Well, that's what Chris, Brian Chris- Johnson's doing with the blueprint. I mean, it's th- th- this this. I, I'm quite fascinated by anti-aging and what's actually happening in in biotech at the moment. Well, could, uh, could I? Sorry, Jamie, you go. Oh, I was just going to highlight one of the, one comment. I know our portal connection to the future is getting ready to uh, to go away here in a second. But <laughs> I wanted to. This is a great question from from someone in the chat. From uh, Jai, uh, does more intelligence lead to more compassion? Right. So you're able to do all these things in the future. Has it has it increased our cap- our innate human capability for compassion or has it done the opposite intelligence has not increased our compassion so more intelligence does not mean more compassion and the reason for that seems to be that uh our compassion stems from emotion and emotion in and of itself is not purely intelligence but this really comes back to what is your definition of intelligence some would argue even now that emotion and intelligence uh are uh, linked in a way that you can't have intelligence without emotion. Uh, however, if you're talking about intelligence in the sense that we would view it, uh, it mostly in the 2020s, then it's just uh, the ability for logical reasoning, right? And so you get this kind of Vulcan you know, possibility where you completely rule out your emotions. And so there's, there's no real compassion as a part of that, but you're still capable of functioning and solving very complicated problems. Um, so there's that. So yeah, no, we had to develop, like I said, we developed a much bigger sense of compassion and empathy because we suffered an unthinkable reality together, which kind of fused all our sharded realities back into one. Could the virtual so great if, thanks, Mark. If, Go if, ahead. If, yeah. If, if 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 compassion is kind of experience, intelligence, relationships, community, it's a, a learned reaction to reality. Does virtual reality do these? If we can ever get to a, 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 a interoperable virtual world, will these? Will this increase compassion? Because we'll have more experience. We'll have more meaningful experience yeah so yeah so you're hitting the nail on the head mark what happened um as technology progressed and allowed us to have these metaverse-esque matrix matrix-esque kind of uh virtual realities we were capable suddenly of basically experiencing anyone's life at any given moment 
this allowed us to create these kind of experiences that we then uh, made a part of the educational system for young people, where they experience, had to experience as part of the education how it would be, for example, to be poor for, for an hour or how it would be to live through a war. And of course, we created these virtual experiences in a way that wouldn't traumatize them, but gave them, because of our understanding of the human uh, body and the human uh, emotion, you know, our, our, our nervous system, etc., had so expanded over over the 2020s in the early 2030s, we knew how far we can stress somebody without giving them actual, you know, uh, negative trauma. So we've come to the point where we can have people experience negative things, uncomfortable things, and we've become aware of the necessity for that, the, the necessity of discomfort, basically like the old, old Stoics also realized, um, to have people grow, not, you know, mentally grow and, and grow their empathy. And because we're now capable of experiencing any life at any moment, anything, we have this system in place in our, our education for young people where they get to experience so many different uh, perspectives on life that allow us to grow empathy in people on a very early age and understanding, uh, which leads to inclusivity and diversity. You've answered the very first question on education, Aragon. That is the the answer to the question to build into the education. And that's how we use th this immersive technology to foster resilience, to foster empathy, to foster compassion. I, I don't know. I have a friend called Wouter uh, van der Bijkaar. He's a Dutch guy. He's super cool. And he's actually building, right, it, it, back in the 2020s, <laughs> back in the 2020, 2024, he was building this project. Turn the time machine <laughs> off, Jeremy. Turn the time machine off. <laughs> Hold on. Time uh, machine, time machine. Hey, great to see you from the future. Yeah, we'll see, we'll see you next time from the future. I'll be. Oof, okay. Hey, Aragorn, you're yeah. back. Uh, Twenty three for Aragorn, man, that was fascinating. We just talked to the future you, but um, uh, yeah. So empathy and uh, technology is going to change the empathy game. We're hearing. And, yeah. Um, and I have a friend who's building this, or he's he has this new idea. He wants to roll out in the Netherlands first, where he transforms a uh, big gym. Uh, exercise rooms into virtual reality experiences for a whole classroom full of children that allows them to do exactly that. They might uh, experience a historical battle or they might experience, you know, how it actually, this is an experiment they ran in the UK a couple of years back. They, cre they recreated a virtual reality uh, experience where they took the recordings of a BBC record reporter who flew in a bomber to bomb Dresden. And they used the sounds from that re radio recording to recreate a virtual experience, virtual reality experience. And this is what Wouter also uh, wants to do on a much broader scale for schools. And this is the kind of educational experience that will allow us to uh, you know, build empathy and build perspective and recreate that shared reality rather than have social media shard our realities. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I, I think empathy is the through line to, to this whole conversation. The questions that we, we asked earlier, not just about education, but how we balance our humanity with technology. Um, that seems to be a, seems to be a pretty awesome takeaway. Aragorn, I, I, I want I, I wish we had gone to the future quicker because that was, that was a fun, <laughs> that was a fun exercise. Um, I, I love your thoughts and your perspectives. Um, Mark's going to do a great write up on you know, where people can find you and get in touch. And um, you know, access the things you have like courses and speaking engagements and all of that kind of stuff. Um, any, any last thoughts for our folks as we, as we wrap up? Don't give in to negativity bias. Humans are wired to see risk and to always be afraid of things. And in today's world through social media, we are also kind of catalyzing that effect. So we're making each other scared. We're making each other ang anxious because we're, you know, empowering that kind of reaction. But we need to resist that. We need to use our logic. We need to use the one thing that really sets us apart on this planet, our mental and emotional capability of taking a moment, taking a deep breath and trying to see the reality and the future for what it really is rather than what we fear it might be. Man, for, the, for those of you uh, listening live, you'll have to jump back on when we put this on Spotify and all the podcast platforms and on YouTube and listen to that collection of words again. I think it's, I think it's really important to consider, really important to think about. Aragorn, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we're here every Thursday live uh, on LinkedIn, but all of this stuff lands on YouTube and Spotify. We talk to the, the founders and futurists defining the future of 
the world we're living in. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed that today. Thanks again to Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E, Marketing's On Demand Talent Platform. If you need a resource, they have 3,000 plus vetted, and that's an important word, vetted solopreneurs uh, to help you with a project, whether you need someone for a week or a more long-term focused project and interdisciplinary teams. They do a great job. Check them out. Mark Fielding, tell us about the book club before we get out of here. The book club where we read books that have stood the test of time and that will sharpen your mind and help you kind of precise knowledge, universal actionability books that we think will help you understand technology and use it in your day-to-day -day life, wherever you work, whenever you work, because we still have jobs because it's 2024. So we still need books. Um, can I just ask one last question to Aragon? I know that you're a big fan of a lot of the, a, a lot of science fiction and we do some hot buttons sometimes, but what's your favorite Tron or snow, tr snow crash? If you had to choose. <laughs> if I had to choose between Tron or Snow Crash. So you're not you're actually giving me very specific choices. Okay, Tron yes. is my absolute favorite. Tron is my absolute favorite over Snow Crash. But I would like to say that I think Snow Crash is actually uh, it's a pretty good book. It's not the best science fiction I've ever read, but it's a pretty good book. But I, it, the, one of my favorites of all time is Neuromancer. Okay, and one more. There Arthur you have Clark it. There Sedan. you have it. Arthur C. Clarke. I think I've lost my connection. <laughs> He's lost the connection. Oh. oh, boy. All right. Well, th this has been a pleasure. Uh, join us uh, for future episodes. Check Thinking on Paper out at thinkingonpaper.xyz. All your podcast platforms were up there and on YouTube. Thanks again for joining. Thanks again to Ripple. And uh, hey, be curious. Stay disruptive. And keep thinking keep on thinking paper. Keep thinking on paper. Keep thinking on paper.